Well, if you get your outlines out with me this morning, we're talking about the promises of God. And I, when, when you look at theology, which is the study of God, the way in which I believe you can get a framework on trying to study God, which you know could be a difficult thing, is when you look at the attributes of God, you can find a little bit about God's character of who He is. God is omniscient. God is uh, everywhere, all things. God is love. And so when you look at, at those things of His attributes, you can get a little bit of framework of who God is. Another way in which you can do that is by looking at the promises of God. Because the promises of God reveals many things. As you know, God's promises are very different than the promises that people make. Oftentimes, people make promises, and sometimes they're just ploys. So when someone breaks a promise, we begin to feel distrustful for all promises. And so consequently, we have a tendency to approach even the promises of God's Word with much caution. However, God's promises can be trusted. Because one of God's characters, if you see this in your very first verse, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, it says, It is impossible for God to lie. So even in God's nature, even in God's character, He can't lie. It is impossible for Him to lie because He is all truth. And so it is a good characteristic. So even in looking at the promises of God, it is a revelation, if you will, of who God is. And so what is interesting, the promises of God are commitments by God to us. And so those promises are a commitment that God makes to us. So in areas of struggle, in areas of temptation, those promises help us to be strong, if you will. Those promises help us in many ways. And so look at the second verse. It is Joshua 21, 45, and it says this. Not one of the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel has failed. All came to pass. So God's promises always come to pass. And that's why it is so important you can take God's promises to the bank. That's why you've heard that song, Standing on the Promises of God. We are standing literally on God's promises uh, for our lives. And so we see this. In other words, God's promises reveal God's character. God's promise reveals God's faithfulness. It reveals God's heart. It reveals God's power. His promises reveal His love to us. And so the best way to get to know God is through the lenses of His promises. Now, what's interesting is there are 7,000 promises in the Bible. And the greatest thing about these promises is it reminds us of who we are. Of who we are. And so when we memorize these promises, we begin to understand His goodness. And it's not only uh, will it reveal something about God, but it also reveals something about us. And so here's what's so awesome that his promises represent something of his divine nature towards us. And so his promises, they're divine promises to his people. So on your outline it says that God reveals our identity through his promises. Sometimes it's easy to forget who we are because I believe we're always under that pool of the world. So when we're faced with temptation, when we're faced with discouragement, when we're faced with adversity, uh, the devil is quick to lead us into believing that we are a victim instead of a victor, a, a loser instead of a winner. And we feel hopeless instead of hopeful. However, God floods us with his promises because the enemy tries to put doubt and discouragement into our lives. And so when you and I can stand on the promises of God's word, it brings us to that hopeful place. It brings us to that place of strength as, uh, uh, as being in despair. And so that's why 
why God's promises are so important. Because the enemy tries to fool us in a way in how we should be. But God's word puts in a perspective of our future. He puts in perspective of where we need to be. That we are victors. Listen, our inheritance is always victory. So no matter what phase you're going through, it's going to end in victory. And that's why we have faith in the Lord. We have faith in His promises. So what I've done for you this morning, about the next seven verses, I put on here a purpose, uh, with a purpose, because what I, I desire for all of us to do is maybe take this home and put it on your refrigerator, and there's 7,000 promises. I'm not going to ask you to memorize all 7,000, but if you could just get a hold of seven. Listen, if you can get a hold of these seven, they will help you in foundational stuff in your life. And so I want to encourage you because we'll all go through tough times. We'll all go through trials, temptations, adversity. And if we can memorize these, it really helps us in life. It gives us a huge foundation. The first one is found in Romans 8.35. And the first two really speaks of God's love for us. And it says this. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, our distress, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sword? So he's saying not, none of those things are going to separate us from the love of God. The next verse says this in Romans 8, 38. He says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers. And he goes on to say, none of those things can separate us from the love of God. Let me just say this, God loves us. God loves us. Do you know how he loves us? He loves us unconditionally. Aren't you glad about that? Because how, how, how many of you know sometimes our conditions aren't that great? <laughs> And so our conditions can change from year to year. They can change from day to day. Sometimes our conditions can change moment to moment. But Jesus has that agape love. Agape love means unconditional love, not based upon condition. That's why we base our relationships and our marriage on unconditional love because conditions change. And so Jesus makes a commitment to us. So it's based upon commitment. The Lord always loves us. It is His nature of love. He loves us. Again, picture your worst day you've ever had. How many of you have ever had a bad day? Real bad day. It wasn't really good. It was really, really bad. You know what? Jesus loved you on that day. Your worst day, where you even turned your back, like Peter denied even knowing Christ, and Jesus never stopped loving. He never stops loving us. It is a great promise. Romans 8, 28 says this. This verse is just in case we mess up. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who are perfect? No. For those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. I love that song. That we, he, he takes the bad stuff and he even makes that good. Do you know he can, he can even make... The bad things that we've done in our lives. And he can even turn those things around for good. Yeah. And have you been there before? Yeah. yeah. God is the only one. Listen. When you factor in God in your situation. Everything changes. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You factor in God. That's why we don't have to freak out through trials and tribulations. Because you factor in God and everything can change. And then Genesis 50, 20. Love this verse. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. And so again, sometimes we go through and God tells us one thing. God told Joseph, you're going to be a ruler in the land, but everything in his life happened the opposite of what he thought it was going to be. But the reason that took place is because God was working something in Joseph's character in order to allow him to be in the place he needed to be. 
So sometimes as you and I go through difficult times, through hard times, those are the very things that strengthen us. There is often advancement in adversity. And a lot of times you and I would not grow if we didn't go through struggles. And it causes us to be a little stronger, a little wiser, a little bit more understanding, a little bit more mercy, more grace, because we understand those things. And then look at Isaiah 54, 17. If you've ever been threatened, if you ever felt in danger, good verse, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. How many of you know it's the Lord that vindicates us? Yeah. How many of you know vengeance is mine, saith the Lord? You don't have to give vengeance to anyone. You know why? Because God's a lot better at it than you are. Because yeah. he always says, hey, leave room for me. He says, leave room for me. You want to take care of it, take care of it. But God takes care of it much better than you do. So he says, hey, don't, vengeance is mine. He says, don't go after him. Hey, our job is to bless him and to free him up. Then God can go, boom, get him. Get him. <laughs> Some of you just woke up right then. <laughs> Isaiah 43, 2 and 3 says this. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. See, what he's saying is, sometimes we feel in situations where we're going to drown, or we're going to burn. But he says, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. But where can we go where the presence of the Lord isn't? Hmm. Here's another verse. Some of you might know it. If you don't, it's a good one to memorize. He says this in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. The Lord has a future and a hope, hope for us. And so when we're going through trials, it's not for calamity. God is working something of goodness in us. So as you go through this, God's intent is not for harm. It's not for calamity. But it's for goodness in your life. And so if we can go through those hard times and embrace them and say, God's up to something. I know it doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't... Smell good. <laughs> I don't know. But you know what? It's going to be good. And if it's not good, you're not done yet. Because when you're done with it, it's going to be good. Right? Because all things work together for good. He knows the plans that he has for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity. Why? To give us a future and a hope. He's working stuff out in us and through us. I want to challenge you, memorize those things. Memorize those things. Why? Because you'll begin to understand the divine nature of God. You'll begin to understand the divine promises that he's given to us. You'll begin to understand his love for us and who we are in him. There are three steps to becoming more like him through his promises. How do we do that? The first one is look for evidence of his presence. Look for evidence of God's presence in your life. Because God's promises change the way we see things. Have you ever been in a place that you're kind of discouraged and you're seeing things through maybe a, a self-pity thing or you're seeing them through this certain lens and you hear the promises of God, and it changes the way you see things. It's called a divine perspective. All the mighty men and mighty women in the Bible 
had a divine perspective. In other words, the world and the people around them saw it one way. Those with a divine perspective saw it in a different way. Okay? Examples all over the place. David was there. All the men, it says, were terrified of the giant called Goliath. But here, a young boy who was so small, couldn't even fit on armor, he was that small, he looks up and has a divine perspective that the giant is a whip compared to the greatness of God. So divine perspective helps you in living this life. And you receive that divine perspective by understanding, knowing, memorizing, and speaking the promises of God in your life. It will change you. It can help but change you. To be a mighty man, mighty woman of valor, as we talked about last week. Look what it says here in Hebrews 13.5. He says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being, say that with me. <laughs> Try it again. Being <laughs> with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So how many of you know we're all blessed? We're blessed people. So what he's saying here is, be content. If you want to go sideways in a hurry, and I see people go sideways in a hurry, you know how you do it? Be discontented with what you have. Amen. Be discontented with your spouse. Be discontented with your kid. Be discontented with your job, this. And you know what? You know what will happen if you're discontented with all those things? You will lose, 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 lose. Discontentment brings loss in your life. Amen. Contentment always brings more. Always brings more. Contentment always brings more. Amen. We live in a spoiled generation, don't we? Yes. Well, my dad, my dad was born in 1913, and he tell, he told me all the things he went through. And well, we don't know what it's like to suffer. My, my dad said he had lard sandwiches. That's what he would, he would have for school. Lard sandwiches. He put cloves of garlic on it. That's what he had, he said, every day. Lard sandwiches. So we're all going to go to my house today. We're going to have lard sandwiches. It's going to be great. Come on, we're blessed, aren't we? And I could use illustration after illustration. And what's so crazy? My dad was content with what he had. And in fact, I think when you go through a depression, you go through times like that. How many of you know that's when you don't appreciate it until it's all gone? <laughs> we live lavish lives, and yet we're still discontented. And the reason that's so important is because as we look for the evidence of His presence, we can be content. Because being content is so important because it causes you, write this down somewhere, to be grateful. Contentment means you're grateful. You have that attitude of gratitude because if you don't have that contentment, if you're not grateful, then you know what happens? You're not thanking God. So no matter where you're at, because we all have different seasons, even Paul says, I've had it lean, I've had it plenty. I've learned to be content in all things. So if you're in your lean time, be content. If you're in abundant time, be content. Don't always want more. Because God's going to bless you when you're grateful and you're thankful for what you have. Amen. Discontentment is the biggest tool of the enemy to get you discontented with what you have. Because he knows what's coming. Loss, 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 loss. Because you know what happens? You get discontented and you seek out yourself to fill a void. The void could only be filled by the Lord. When you're discontented, you seek out this to fill the void. And guess what it does? Nothing. Maybe for a moment. But then you've got to find something else. And you've got to find something else. And you keep you have to find other things to fill the void that only God can fill. God's presence is all around us. This is a powerful thing, even why we hang out together with other believers or why we come to church. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Isn't that a great promise? I've quoted that many times. Hey, we got two of us. Let's pray.
<laughs> God's here. God's here. And then number two, becoming more like him, develop a glad obedience to his word. The word glad obedience is an important thing. When you ask a child to do something, and you say, hey, clean your room. And they go, uh, oh, I can't they clean my room. <laughs> and, and then that one thing that happens like two or three times in a lifetime, they go, and they, they clean their room on their own. Have you ever seen that? You say, what has happened to my kid? You know? The Lord said, because they did not serve me with a glad heart, I put a wasting disease in the midst of them. There's one thing to serve the Lord. There's another thing to serve the Lord with a glad heart. Amen? Amen. We get to be the servants of the Most High God. There's no greater place than that. Amen. I think the quickest way to the throne is through the servants' courts. <laughs> Because the Lord is a servant of all. He did not come to be served, it says. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. A glad obedience to his word. The Bible says that the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. In Galatians 3.14 on your outline it says this, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Faith. Through faith. Faith is such an important thing because if God's word says something, how many of you know it takes faith to do God's work? Yeah. Yeah. If the Lord says it's better to give than to receive, then guess what? It's better to give than to receive. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be on the giving end than on the receiving end any other day, right? Yeah. When I see somebody in need, how many of you would rather be on that giving end, right? Yeah. So if the Lord says to do this, if the Lord says, hey, you don't have sexual relationship before marriage, then guess what you do? You don't do that before marriage. Marriage is a context that is, is not reserved for love, it's reserved for marriage. And so those things are important. God's word, to have a glad obedience to God's word. If God's word says give, you give. If God's word says to do this, you do this. If God's word says to love, show mercy, show grace. How about forgiveness? See, forgiveness is a gift. Some of you have a hard time forgiving. Yeah. How are we to forgive? Forgive like Jesus forgives. Freely and immediately, right? You guys already knew that stuff. I probably don't even need to preach. <laughs> Hebrews 6.12 says this, So that you will not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience Inherit the promises. That is a good word. We are to obey his word. His character quality begins to develop inside of us. As we follow the things of the Lord. So don't be sluggish, it says. But be one who imitates someone like David or Moses or Esther. These and others. were tutored by God's word and inherited the fullness of his promises. Like those before us, a part of our inheritance, we may go through a rough season. And if we've been obeying God's word, we'll have a strong confidence rather than a victim's mentality. We're not victims. We're victors. We live in a society where everyone is a victim. That is a life from the pit of hell because we are victors. Amen. Why do we go through struggles? Why do we go through testing? You know what? 
there, there's a reason and there's a purpose. Because God is building character in us. Would you write that down? It builds God's character in us. Second Peter 1, 5 through 8 says, Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, as you begin to know Christ, there's something of character that takes place inside of you. If you've fallen short or way short, you begin to understand God's mercy. You begin to understand God's grace upon your life. And then what happens when you know those things and understand, you know what happens? You begin to understand of how to show mercy to others. How to show grace to others. God has shown you love, so you show God's love to others. You've had to forgive, and so you understand the forgiveness of God, so you're allowed to forgive others. And you begin to see the strength and character of the Lord, and you can be strong in character. God builds something in us. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. There are those things that build up in us as we submit to the Spirit of the living God. And then the last point this morning, choose to live by God's promises. You and I have a choice. We can walk in defeat, we can walk in victory. We can walk in our own self-strength or we can walk in the promises of the living God. If all His promises come true, doesn't it stand to reason that it would be very wise to walk in those promises of the Lord? I was talking to somebody last week. I was talking about blessing last week. And how we don't seek God's blessing, but when we seek the Lord, the God's blessing is in front of us and behind us and wherever we go. I'm blessed. How about you? God blesses us. And this person going through a difficult time and yet could see the orchestration of God's blessing in their life. I mean, God's just orchestrating. You know why? Because that person walks seeking the Lord, standing on the promises of God, and God's blessing and blessing and blessing where it looked like it was really bad. Guess what happened? It was really, really good. <laughs> and it turned out really, really good. That's the type of God we serve. This is the, probably the most important verse I'm going to read for you today. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. <coughs> And try to grasp this because it's that important. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. So that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And so this is an important aspect as we see the lust of the world is always pulling us to become worldly. So if we know his promises and incorporate them in our lives, then we will we become more like him? Therefore, the 7,000 promises help us to become partakers of his divine nature. Did you get that? So there's something of of something that is departed within us of His divine nature through His divine promises, His divine commitments to us. That's why it's so important. His promises are so deep and important for us. They have been granted to us. His, present, His precious and magnificent promises. Is that awesome? His promises are so wonderful, he says, and they've been granted to us. 
We are the beneficiaries of these wonderful promises. That's why it's so important that you and I know what they are and we stand on them and we receive them and claim them for our very own. That's right. That divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. The world desires to be fed. There are short things that are not lasting. And then the last verse, 1 John 4, 4, it says, You are from God, little children, and you have overcome them. My most favorite part of the verse right here, because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. It is such a great promise that he says, greater is he that is in you. I love that. Greater is he that is in you than he, Satan, and the world that's here. What's greater? Christ in you. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Christ in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I would leave my house all the time and say that verse. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Because it's so powerful and it's a reminder to me why the enemy tries to come after us. Because he can't take away Christ in you so he tries to diminish it through getting you into sin. By getting you to be doubtful. By putting discouragement in your heart and life. Why? Because of Christ in you. I want to challenge you. Live like Christ is in you. Live like Christ is in you. Live like the promises that God has given was just for you. Because they are. And when we rise up and live up to that promises, there is something of his divine nature that takes place, and we see life through different lenses of his promises that he has for us.